First, the bad news. SAP Business AI won't generate amusing holiday cards, but it will personalize career paths for your people and let you know which suppliers are best so you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real world results. That's SAP Business AI. I'm Inc. Executive Editor Diana Ransom, and you are listening to Inc. Uncensored. Today's episode, Founders and the Media. When starting a business, there are so many factors and tasks to handle, raising capital, hiring staff, supply chains, and on and on. But one factor that can so often get neglected is how founders navigate the media, whether that's trying to get earned media to grow your business or having to face tough questions during a crisis. You have to be prepared because the success of your business can depend on how you handle talking to the media. So today you are going to hear a conversation that Inc. Editor-in-Chief Scott Omlianek and I had with three founders who are experts dealing with news outlets. Our first founder saw his company explode before having a very public fall. He knows firsthand how you handle bad press. Stacy Spikes, CEO and co-founder of MoviePass. Stacy, after being ousted from MoviePass during its fall, has bought his company back and is rebuilding. Our next founder built a company in her 20s and approached the media with youth and savvy. Catherine Minshew, founder of The Muse. Catherine stepped down as CEO of The Muse, an online career platform, just days before this roundtable. And our final founder created a PR firm that has represented some of the biggest brands in the world. Taryn Langer, founder of Moxie Communications Group. Taryn has coached founders through just about every aspect of media communications. I started off our conversation with the basics and asked Stacy and Catherine about their personal experience with the media. For me, I felt like early on, the media was one of the best channels I had for helping people understand what I was trying to do and why I was trying to do it. And the very early idea for the muse involved really two sides of a marketplace, although I didn't think of it quite that way back then. We had individual job seekers, especially women in the early days, and then companies that I was trying to get in front of. And, you know, in the very early days of the business, we didn't have funding, we didn't have a marketing or sales organization. And so by telling my story, I got in front of people who should either be using my product as a consumer, or um, once we started to have something to sell, that was actually the source of a lot of our early sales leads. Catherine, I have to ask why you had such trust in them to tell the story the way you wanted it to be told and thought they were an ally and, and not some impartial entity that would go off in another direction or include other voices or, or what have you. Yeah, in fairness, I was never afraid of other voices being included. I felt like we had a really unique perspective on the job search space and the career space. And if somebody wanted to talk about me and five other companies, great. I was just glad to be part of it. I also found early on that it was very hard to get funding. We were, uh, I think, the first all-female team to ever go through Y Combinator. I had a brutal fundraising journey. And so some of the early press coverage that we got also served as validation for investors. Obviously, nobody wants to feel like something is twisted. I've only had very few times when I've ever felt that the case, but it's interesting. I do think, and maybe this has changed now, but I felt like from a lot of the other founders that I knew, some who were early stage and some who were later stage, that if you were a pretty well-intentioned person, that a lot of the coverage in the very early days even if you didn't have it all figured out, at least was trying to be like, hey, here's a person trying to do a thing. I did see a number of founders when they hit a certain inflection point, when their business got to a certain size, the way they were covered yeah. changed pretty dramatically. They want to see you succeed until they want to watch you burn. Yeah. Well, yeah. so so you, you said <laughs> twisted. Stacy. you've had a journey that certainly could lend itself to twisting of the tail. Did you <laughs> experience that um, with your, you know, uh, creation of departure from and return to? Yeah. So what's really funny about this landscape, so far we're speaking in this monolithic media, and there's so many nuances. There's the friendlies. So if you're tech 
and you go to certain places, you got the friendlies, you've got the consumer facing, you've got the, you know, are you in the post or the daily news because <laughs> of something? So you get these nuances. And so same thing after reaching a certain scale, then you became something to take pot shots at it. And there's all these under current things that social was driving. So we had a situation where we had risen up and we found that AMC was starting to become somewhat adversarial. And there were people on social that we found out were hired to go and make comments. And then some of those things were getting picked up. Hey, what's your thoughts on these comments, right? And so there's all these different aspects, but there's certain certain outlets that wouldn't even go down that path. And so you get a lot of different, the bigger you get, the more you get to play. I, I, I think we, so for the people listening, uh, Diana, I want to dispel this idea of the a media actually being a thing, right? A monolith, yeah. As, yeah. As, as you said, or monolithic, as you said, right? Or a puppet master. Like, I can't even get my own frigging reporters to agree with yeah. me, <laughs> let alone to, uh, like, spread that uh, uh thesis or idea across, you know, a landscape of various companies to have a group think, right? Like there is no group think in media. And and to some extent, I think that much like politics and, and government, we get the media we deserve. So as you mentioned, you know, people are clicking on inflammatory social posts and things like that, right? There's, we, we can't control the fact that there are bad actors out there hiring content farms to, to, to do their bidding, right? But we can control what we click on, but but if we're only clicking on the inflammatory stuff, that is going to be because, um, you know, the press for the most part is still a for-profit operation. Profits a lot smaller now than they used to be. But the fact is, right, um, we're going to follow the opportunity for the most part. And, and I say we generally, I don't mean Inc., right? And so we get what we deserve in that way. I mean, but Catherine hit on a point where investors will dive into an article and they, they'll they have questions because that's how they're getting up to speed. And they'll use an article to come back with, oh, hey, here's a good point. How are you going to grow in this way? Do you see this competition is? And you can tell what article they spent time on based on what they read. And sometimes you get, they just saw a clickbait article, right? And they said, they just ask you a softball question and they're not really looking for anything deep. They're like, oh, okay, thanks, you know. But when you're really grinding it out and people want to do their due diligence, they will pull up a longer form article and let that be their uh, cheat sheet on what they need to look at you from. And the hope is it's it's accurate. I was going to say, I think that's a really interesting thing. Um, one of the ways over the course of the Muse's life that I answered the questions about, you know, data. How big is the site? I would talk about our our monthly active users and how many millions of people were using the site every month. No one ever asked me to verify that. Mm -hmm. Only one investor out of the tens of millions that I raised for the Muse ever asked that. And I was really impressed with someone did. And what's interesting is I was always accurate, but we ended up having a competitor who got a lot of press at one point with numbers that I know were totally falsified. And then I would have investors be like, ooh, how are you competing with this site? You know, I saw so-and-so that they have like 8 million people a week. And I'm like, that's not true. And actually, you can go online and demonstrate that that's not true. But it was so interesting because it would appear somewhere. And then people not only held it as gospel, but then told us that we were perhaps not growing fast enough or not so do performing. So do you take the time to try to dispel those numbers without, you know, looking like you're hangry at them or... Um, not, I mean, there's so many things to do in mm -hmm. a day, not typically. It's hard. I mean, I don't think you want to be the one, especially as another founder. Right. Um, but it was really interesting because it made me think, um, again, I think most people are telling the truth, but it was just fascinating how easy it seemed for this one person. So you're not going to tell us who, who that, <laughs> what, what that company was? No, not no. on this podcast. <laughs> uh, all right. So, so, but we we can say it's fair that uh, numbers uh, aren't always accurate. Sometimes, um, to that point, though, I think one thing that we kind of touched upon before is it. It's important to understand how to use media, right, for both their audience as well as the credibility that comes from having a publication like Inc. or, or someone else willing to invest the time and resources to cover you. But to couple that also with 
content where you can tell that story in a really controlled way to try to balance out trust that that you're building. The the data point is really interesting. I've come up against that a number of times as as someone who works in PR, you know, when I have clients telling me, you know, share this metric, share these growth numbers. And I just say, well, be prepared to back it up. I see, by the way, looking across the table, Taryn, that Catherine is drinking a product of one of your clients. I'm really happy to <laughs> see that. <laughs> um, Thank you. And Thank and I know that you're not necessarily here to liquid, talk about liquid death. Liquid death. <laughs> you're not here to talk about what was your that? clients. What? what? <laughs> liquid death available at <laughs> um, unless it benefits them. But you did just experience watching a conversation uh, with someone relatively well known who was asked about her numbers and and didn't. Uh, necessarily come back with the best responses. And and I would love for you to talk about that as a matter of something else that I think is really important when you meet with the media, and that's real preparation, not an expectation that your story is going to get told. Right. So it was awkward and uncomfortable to watch. I just came back from the Code Conference, and Linda Yaccarino was on stage with Julia Borston, and, uh, you know, she was up there uh, put in a position to defend advertising revenue losses, monthly active users, et cetera. And she stumbled on stage. And so it was unfortunate to see her on stage stumbling, uh, not being able to rattle off those monthly active user numbers um, or where the revenue declines were. You know, it's uh, it doesn't instill a lot of confidence, I think, when you see a CEO up there trying to sort of create narratives around numbers Right. And I, I think a lot of founders maybe get into an uncomfortable position where they don't realize it's sometimes okay to say, like, I'm not going to share that. So, Stacy, you have not necessarily been in that situation, but you have been in oh, a situation yes, I where. Have. <laughs> oh, you, you have. Similar things are where people. So, what may, happens when things go have. sideways? Let's talk about that. Like, when yeah. you're not. Basically, when the narrative goes in a direction that you're not comfortable with, and how do you handle that? I've totally been in hostile hot seats. Um, and because it's the movie industry, the gotchas and the faster, like television's the worst. And so I had a situation where when we first launched the very first time, we were going through movietickets.com and doing an API integration. And you can't just get the API access. Like you got to, they got to give you keys and hand it off. And <clears throat> so we announced- You that, were not sneaking in the back door. Yeah, you can't. We had gotten all of this done and we had spent several months building the app, going through that integration in what they call deep links. And so pe- the consumer doesn't see, but they're going from one gateway to another through these deep links. And so- Uh, AMC and Landmark had came out and said, we never heard about this movie pass thing. We don't know where this thing came from. It just came out of nowhere and we're not approving it and we're not going to let them in in our theaters. And so we had to go do some damage control and PR said, okay, go on TV. And so I'm in I'm in New York and I've got a the bug in my ear and I'm listening and I'm in a room with just a monitor and they're from Los Angeles and I hear the lead in going next we're going to have the CEO of Movie Pass and we're going to ask him what was he thinking trying to launch this company without getting theater approval and I was like And so, and it was just, and one of the things that I learned, this was the very first kind of fire and brimstone, which was the art of, this is a three minute segment. It is a fire drill. And you better have all your answers. It doesn't matter what they ask you, just have your statements just lined up. And I didn't. And I went in there and I tried to answer what she was asking. So what were you thinking? Well, that's actually... And this is how, and before you finish your sentences, but is that how you do business? Oh is that, God. you know, and it was just, and before I ever finished the complete sentences, she goes, that's all the time we have today. And like, and then the, the guy who comes in the room, he comes in and he couldn't even make eye contact with me. He just takes it, he just takes the earpiece and goes, have a good weekend. <laughs> 
I, I oh, was man. roasted and I, I went and got in the bed for three days. Well, part of it, you know, I, I think part of the issue and, and maybe this is maybe largely endemic to how comms and PR is, has operated for so long, but we think that there's a certain way to be media trained and have your sound bites and don't worry about the question you're being asked. You know, it's that, it's that Henry Kissinger quote, like, do you have a question for my answer or something? <laughs> mm-hmm. And what we fail to realize, like when you look at some of the great I think entrepreneurs who are, you know, speakers and deliver great interviews is it's just a little bit of like humanity and remembering that we're all people sitting around a table. Granted, we might have different incentives and what we're looking to get out of that interview, but some of the best stuff just, you know, happens as if you're talking. So so being authentic, Mm -hmm. like you need to bring your authentic self regardless of how Totally. And it's hard to understand what authentic really means. You know, it's become one of those words, but- but just like the basics of like human connection in a conversation and realizing that it's okay to, before you evade a question, sort of explain where you're coming from in that moment. So um, that happened to me. Uh-huh. Um, I, I was running a home improvement brand at, at a certain point. Um, and in the middle of the recession, driven by a housing crisis, right, we still managed to be smart enough about we, what we were doing and take all of the disruption that was happening in digital media and use it to our advantage to to be on Ad Age's uh, A-list in, in, in that year, right? And that triggered an interest in the New York Times business section doing a story on on the brand. And, and the, the brand, by the way, was um, This Old House Ventures, which is a television show that's been on the air for 45 years. And so it was having this renaissance two-thirds of the way into its age uh, now. While um, Scott was running it. Yeah, <laughs> just pointing that out. Um, thank you. Uh, your job is safe for now. Yeah. Um, the reporter started talking to me. Found out I was doing my own renovation. Found out oversharing from our comms person that I had, had uh, just had a child that uh, uh, was uh, the sort of uh, gift of a few years of infertility. And she decided that she wanted to come t- to my house. And this was terrifying to me because I thought we were doing a business story. And this business story was about the success we were having. And that was the end of it. And and she came to the house, at which I cleaned thoroughly before she came, right? And spent a whole bunch of time there. And the story went from being a business story about this old house to how the editor-in-chief of this old house fucked up his own renovation and took three years to do it and ended up being a two-page story in the living section, not the business section, <laughs> oh, right? No. And um, Did you at- think about like when the photographer came and just started shooting your house that maybe the story was going to be different? So yeah, so, so the photographer came back and I knew the story was different then and we had just decided Go with it's it. the New York Times. Yeah. You you yeah. you have to. There'll be some boost and some uncomfortable personal exposure, I suppose. Right? Um, though I know I have great taste, so I wasn't worried about the <laughs> photographer. Yeah. But um, it was an entirely different story, right, than the one I wanted to tell. And we had to take what we could get from it because our, as you pointed out, Taryn, like. Our goals were not necessarily the ones of the reporter. The reporter was interested in the best story for the audience of the New York Times, and that's what they decided was more important. Um, and so despite that, you know, discomfort, you know, we went with it. And in my case, it was great. I got a book offer out of it, ultimately. So I didn't, I never wrote the book. Oh, so, yeah. so, so that, but it was sort of a Mr. Blanding's doesn't build his dream house. Yeah. And, <laughs> uh, and I actually hired the reporter here at Inc. Cause she was such a great reporter. Um, so it, it sort of worked out for both of us. But the point is, I guess I'm trying to make is there's the intentions you have as a founder and the inform or business person and the information you want to get across and what's important to the reporters and editors and the audience they have. And one key element in that is, you know, there's only one question that I ask myself before I do anything with clients is why should anyone care? Right. Mm -hmm. And that reporter decided no one cares. (laughs) No one's going to care as much about the business story that you were trying to tell as much as a lot of people are going to care about what a pain in the ass that home renovation was and how you were managing that with a, you know, that had more value for readers yeah, than what you thought so, had right? value for them. 
You know, it's interesting. I think a lot of this ties back to the classic improv rule, which is yes and. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was a big theater kid when I was younger, and I've been surprised how well that experience or those lessons, especially improv, ended up playing both in, you know, talking on stage, live television, just being able, because I feel like also on TV in these three-minute clips, a big part of it is just like, absolutely, and. <laughs> like Just keep and, smiling. Yeah. <laughs> I, for me, I don't know if this resonates with anyone else, but the best advice I ever got when I was doing television for the first time is um, imagine that you're at a crowded party and you see someone you want to impress across the room and they're looking at you. So you're having your conversation, but you're just having it a little bit sparklier and a little bit more enthusiastically than you might normally because you know this person that you really want to impress is watching you. And for whatever reason, that single fact got me through a lot of the early TV. I don't know if I ever had a big gotcha, but constantly I was being asked about things that I was not told about in advance, was not prepared for. Um, are you being sparklier right now than <laughs> you usually are? Honestly, probably. Bit, right? Yeah. 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 We're, you I know. feel like I want to be sparklier now. Yeah. <laughs> you said that, so. It's a great adjective. Can't go wrong. The one thing to add on that I think we're all saying is there is no substitute for experience. Like being in the hot seat, being there, being under the lights, being under that clock, or doing long interviews and learning there is an art form where they're going to get you for a long time and they're going to come back to questions when you get more comfortable that you weren't thinking about. You're not you supposed know. to tell people that. <laughs> so, t t tell, t t so tell me, do you, do you take clients through any sort of training like that? Yeah, I, I mean, mean we'll do. do I, I tend to call it message training more than media training because I, I want people to feel natural and feel comfortable and unless there's something that's going to be wildly distracting when they're in front of a camera. And I've seen some crazy stuff before. Like I had a client once who suddenly just developed this blinking mania where they were just blinking like a, <laughs> a million miles a minute in front of the camera. I'd never seen it. I was like, okay, well, let's focus on that because that's a little distracting. <laughs> but it's just, it's understanding. I always say, like, connect your heart and your head with what you're trying to say, right? Like, you really have to feel it in your heart and think about to try to communicate the message through a, a specific anecdote, right? Like, paint a picture, tell, tell a colorful story around it. But one of the things... Stacey just said around experience, that's key. And so many first-time founders or young founders will feel like, well, it's not worth my time, right? How big is this audience? Doing this interview is not going to be worth my time. And it's exactly what you said. It's experience. It will pay off in the long run. You have to get comfortable doing it. No matter how many times we practice behind closed doors, there's nothing that replaces actually being in front of someone um, who you're not paying to be there and answering their questions. And I think the other thing is, is really become a student of watching CEOs do interviews. Mm -hmm. When you look at CNBC, CNBC is because there's finances and usually they're on there because something's not going right, they're either about to go do some IPO and take a victory lap or stuff is really wrong. There's very, oh, we just came on today just because. And watching those interviews every day for lunch, everything from body position, like I love watching Bob Iger do his mm -hmm. interviews. Yeah, he's a pro. He He's Frank Sinatra, mm -hmm. right? And he knows how to just... Sit in the seat, they throw things at him, and he just, well, you know, you know, he's very, and and so you become a student of the craft because that is part of your job. And today, every CEO is a video star. Yeah. You you are, that's the world we live in now. You mentioned these two points where, you know, they went on camera and then the, you know, stock tanked, for instance, coming from a crisis comms perspective. How often do things go nuclear, like in a startup? They go nuclear, I think, when, and this is something that I heard Catherine say on a podcast uh, a while ago, which is when the external impression is not matching with like the internal impression, right? If you are out there publicly saying one thing, but you have a team or hundreds of employees who know it to be the opposite, um, that's when things really, really blow up, right? I, I think founders not even, you know, need to ask themselves both, 
you know, why should anyone care about this story? What am I going to say? But also, um, who am I speaking to, right? And I think a lot of times in crisis scenarios, you want to be speaking to your teams first before you speak to media, before you even speak to your customers, because you're going to need all hands on deck. You might need to manage a situation as it escalates on social media. I mean, things will spread like wildfire. I would say the biggest crisis scenarios I've seen where companies have imploded in recent years have all actually started from employee leaks, right? And that's when things totally go awry. You need your team supporting you. You need your team backing you um, in in order to overcome a, a situation. That's brilliant. Yeah. So, First, the bad news. SAP Business AI won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos. But it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia. Or identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks and automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations so you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real world results. That's SAP Business AI. Scott, I'd love to have you speak for the media here. Are we all just out for blood? Or is there a way to kind of address the media in a sort of a smart way? It ain't, I don't think we're out for blood. And that doesn't mean we shy away from what the truth is or what a story that, that needs to be told. But our, I think our perspective is one of uh, trying to help our audience, who happens to be the same people we cover, so quite different than, say, sports or entertainment or things like that, for the most part. I think we're trying to leave them with useful lessons in the end, right? I think, as I said before, you, you know, you get the media you deserve as a public. And so if we're only clicking on outrage bait and, and all of that stuff, that is what the media, which is not this monolithic thing, but a bunch of people being very responsive to their own consumers are going to give us. So to some extent, it's up to all of us to try and, I think, you know, usefully elevate the conversation. Don't be your basest self when you're consuming, but be a bit, I mean, you can you can do that. There's time <laughs> for that, right? Um, but don't make all two hours scrolling through uh, Twitter or X, whatever it's called now, to work yourself in a state or, or only click on the links that have the headlines that are outrageous about a, a founder, right? So no, I think I think there are times when we really want to help people tell their stories. There, there are, I mean, the people at this table, uh, there are, are stories that we think are important to tell because we hope it elevates us as a society. And we would be happy to cover them and have covered the, the companies represented at this table, whether it's our two founders or whether it's Aaron, who's a founder as well, but who also represents many founders, because it's socially responsible, or we think it is, right? Uh, or it's educational for our audience. That said, there are those places that are. And, and I think we also have to make a decision about how much time we really want to spend on social media, uh, which is a very different thing than media. It's a different thing in terms of its intent. It's not a different thing in terms of the time and attention it occupies, and, and that, that causes a problem. So how do you change the narrative? You've been in this situation, Stacy, a number of times where, you know, the story seems to kind of like have gone off the rails. Mm -hmm. Clearly, Taryn's advice was address it and answer the question you, you really want to talk about sort of address and then move on. It's a very political kind of speak there. How have you dealt with it? I know you even wrote a book to tell your side of the thing. So if you could kind of talk about like how you've handled it. So I forgot the exact words Taryn used, but uh, you were talking about more framing the idea of what you love and why you're doing it versus getting specific talking points, like pointing your client in the right direction. And so for me, everything comes back to, I love movies. <laughs> I love connecting great film and getting audiences to see them. And everything we do is in the pursuit of that. And if you agree with that alignment that you love movies too, great, let's have a conversation, but you're going to find everything we're trying to do we're breaking things because we're so excited about making new stuff happen. And so you get out there and you're going to break stuff. And I find once you get to that footing and you come back to, here's why we're here. Mm -hmm. Then people are like, oh, what am I going to say about that, right? There's 
never like intentional wrongdoing. There's, and I, one, one of my investors in our last investor update, I said, I gave the app a C, a C minus. And I said, here's what we did wrong. Here's what we need to do better. Here's where we're going and here's when we're going to get there. And several of them were like, I really just love your honesty. It's like you're so honest that you are giving yourself a report card. And they're like, every founder we have, everything's great. Everything's up and to the right. All the arrows are green and we're rocking it and it's awesome. And they really like the honesty. And so I've found being that guy, it's just easier. Like someone said, you never have to lie when you always tell the truth. Now that I'm listening to to you talk, I'm thinking part of why I think The Muse was successful at getting a lot of press early on is a big part of what I focused on is it's so hard to figure out what you want to do with your life. And almost everybody with a very select few people that had like the most blessed career path ever and often end up being investors. (laughs) Most people, they hear some version of that and they're like, yeah, it is really hard. And you get people to think of that sort of human lens on it. I think the fact that we were able to start the conversation there in so many places, it helps set the stage for. Part of what made you desirable to write about is your, your embrace of entrepreneurship. You know, you weren't just into careers. You were a woman business owner, and you were owning it, and you were stepping into the role in a really sort of <laughs> remarkable, notable way. And part of that, by the way, is, um, you know, when I was starting The Muse, I knew almost no other women starting companies. I mean, I saw a few. There were, um, you know, I, I looked up to the founders of Rent the Runway. I was going to say Rent the Runway. Um, was yeah. Back then, yeah. Um, and, and, you know, Alexa Von Tobel at LearnVest. But there were very, very few. And by the way, they were, I think almost all of them were like, you know, Harvard Business School. I yes. didn't go to my MBA. Um, I went to But you a, had McKinsey in your background. Which was helpful. Yeah. Which was really helpful. Honestly, more helpful as a safety net where I was able to take on a lot of debt and know that I could be employed again than maybe specifically helpful in connections. But I felt like... You know, I went to a conference before we applied to Y Combinator, and every single person on stage was a guy. And so when the muse started to have a little bit of success and people wanted to talk about being an entrepreneur, I was like, all right, well, look, I mean, I'm new to this, but sure, like, you want to talk? Let's go. And I think that's partially why I also felt some responsibility for talking about some of the harder stuff later on, uh, both with being an entrepreneur in general, uh, but also being a female entrepreneur, because, you know, there was a time when nobody was talking about it. And I also would have these private conversations with entrepreneurs, um, earlier stage entrepreneurs, women, and, you know, they would say, like, this thing happened, and, you know, I think I'm the only one it happened to, so maybe it's my fault. And I'm like, newsflash, it's not your fault. You're not the only one it happened to. Why are we not talking about this? Um, and so at some point I was like, all right, well, I guess it'll just be me. It'll have to but be But by you. the way, the first time I talked, I think I, I may have been one of the first people years before Me Too to, to talk about uh, investors hitting on female founders. And I got 50 emails. I was going to ask you what happened after that. I got a lot of inbound and some people were like, oh my God, thank you for saying something. Uh, But a lot of people were like, wow, are you ever going to be able to raise funding again? I mean, that was really bold, but also like, are you sure? (laughs) Um, And you know what? I wasn't sure. I just did it because it just felt like the right thing to do. But I used to have disagreements with my partner at the time. And he would be like, you know, just put your head down and be successful. And then you can talk about all of this. And I was like, well, I don't know. Nobody's talking about it, and I think it needs to be talked about. And I I have no regrets now because I think we've opened up the conversation in a way that's allowed for a lot of positive forward movement. But, you know, it it wasn't so clear-cut at the time. It definitely felt like Like a a risk. risk. Yeah, Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there were people who were like, that's a distraction. Focus on your business. You know, this is sort of a good segue. I mean, you actually just stepped down as CEO of your company. Now you have nothing to lose, right? (laughs) 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 What, like... So what's going through your head now? Like, where where are you at? And are you willing to talk about it yet? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I think that uh, I feel like anytime there's a major transition, but especially this one where, you know, I've been running and building the same company for 12 years. I mean, I was like a baby when I started The Muse looking back. I feel like I'm still in this process of how do I think about it and how do I want to 
talk about it. And also, you know, I know I want to keep talking about entrepreneurship and startups because I love building companies. I want more people to understand how companies get built. I'm asking a lot of questions like, do I want to still keep talking about careers as much as I have been for 12 years? And the answer is I don't really know. But I just feel like most of the things I've learned have come from someone else being honest about them. I think this is a really Im- important and, and useful thing, right? Like, and, and Stacey, as a movie fan, you know this. There are a set of narratives that work over and over and over again. And the media tends to fall into them in the same way because they're easy to tell and they know they resonate with people from when we, you know, sat around little fires on the savannah or whatever it was, right? But the real learning actually comes when we break those traditional narratives, those tropes, and and sort of approach things differently, right? That raising money is hard as a woman founder and you have sexual harassment during it. That not every successful startup happened uh, in a Stanford dorm room uh, with a pair of 20-year-olds. And so being able to get past that is useful as uh, Taryn is as as, as Catherine was talking, I was uh, of her leaving the news. I was mindful of a story we did with one of your former clients, Michael Dubin, who also did not know what he necessarily was going to do after uh, leaving Dollar Shave. And I think um, that was an incredibly important story for us because someone who otherwise, you know, you would have thought of as quite successful and, you know, no problems in the world, right? He just made a ton of money, must be fine. Suddenly there's this place where, oh, I can connect with that because I feel that way. First of all, he's a fellow improv uh, uh, yeah. student and who has talked about how that has has served him so well. One of the interesting things, again, going back to this like founder myth, Stanford dorm room ideas, you sort of have 90 days before you announce what your next job is. Otherwise, you're not that serial entrepreneur when you're asked immediately, you know, what's next for you. It's we have to be able to start creating that space. I think a lot of founders struggle with. I'm definitely taking more I'm, than 90 days. <laughs> <laughs> as as one should. But I think what I've seen in my experience is a lot of founders struggle with some of this pressure, maybe pressure to remain relevant, right? Pressure to remain out there. So that way it can be in service of what they're going to do next. And that's when I see people turning to content or social media and not really taking that time to step back and really assess and look at the world with new eyes after having gone through that experience. Founders are really great at, you know, do as I say, not as I do. Find your work-life balance, work from home a few days a week, you know, et cetera. And then firing off emails at like 2 a.m., et cetera. So it's, it is important to, and it's okay to to take that time and, and reassess all of that. He's also an example of somebody who um, kind of got stuck in the same story trope, right? Everybody cared about the viral video. Yeah. Nobody wanted to hear anything else. And he talked about it, and you could tell in interviews that he was, he was tired of talking about mm-hmm. it. And he did not keep that a secret. Just this idea, I think, as well of... And we were talking before about these like very clear cut narratives and sometimes it's it's just very nuanced. And I think that's where as a founder or as someone who is engaging with the media, it does really help if you know or trust the reporter because they are your intermediary for something that's not necessarily very easy. Like when you can kind of put your story in a little box and be like, you know, we launched this thing, we had this big success, you can kind of give that box to a lot of different people and you probably end up with a really similar result. What I think is really, can be really interesting is when you have something like someone transitioning out of a job, a more thorny problem, questioning a norm or a standard or a set of behaviors in an industry, part of it is what you say and then part of it is the perspective and research and work put in by whoever it is that's actually writing that story and taking it to the right. world. Will it, will it be in the right hands? Yeah. You know, it's funny you, what you said is stepping outside of that box when I got fired from Movie Pass and that went down in flames, I was so pissed that I wrote a book, right? And it was, it didn't start, I'm going to write a book. It was more therapy to not lose my mind because what I saw happen 
Now there's federal indictment charges that came down. But back then it was like, they just got away with burning down something I worked for 12 years on. Like, oh, you know, and I I wanted to... (laughs) I wanted to at least capture, and it was, I had never seen a book that someone said, hey, I just failed. Here's a book. I'd never seen a bestseller that said, I just failed, right? But I felt like there were young founders, minorities and women that were going to be coming behind me, and I needed to write down what happened because... There were ways to avoid it, but when maybe you're not multi-generational and you don't have the money and you didn't have a bunch of lawyers, and there's a lot of history of Black entertainers or Black athletes. And right now, for me, it's when you're only looking at 1% of venture capital, I am the Hank Aaron right now. I am the Willie Mays. I am those guys who were the first ones on the field And part of why the book was like called Black Founder with my face on the cover was like the publisher said, we don't know of a tech book with a diverse founder. Like there aren't any. And so the more the faces can get out there when they're walking into the the room with the VCs who travel in packs based on four schools, it's like you got to start changing that narrative one face at a time, one pitch at a time. And, but I love what you said. Like when you started talking about your partner and saying, do you really want to talk about that right now? And people are like, I had people say to me, cared, do you really want to write that in a book? Do you really want to be that guy? Do you want to like end up like the Spike Lee of, And I was like, I I just can't let it go. I I can't let this happen because it's going to happen to other people if I don't say something. Did any media reach out to you and want to tell your side of the story? Or did you feel like at that time after you were fired that anyone was willing to tell your side? Business Insider wanted to, but articles can't get into the depth that a book Sure. And 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 I just felt like... I need it to go so deep Mm -hmm. that it can't be, even if it's a 2,000, 3,000 word article, it still wasn't going to get into those issues. And and I, I would say Jason at Business Insider... And I talked to him a bit, but there, you just can't get that deep. Right. And so there were things and stories that I, I needed to be able to tell, like times when I there was a, a moment where Jeff, who worked with me, we walked into a VC room and this young VC walks right up to Jeff, who went to Stanford and says, hi, Stacy, nice to meet you. And Jeff goes, that's Stacy. And like, and there was a tough thing to walk a line of, is this racism or is this pattern recognition? Those are very different things because I don't think anybody ever said, I don't want to invest in him because of his race. I think it was always, he doesn't look like what I think in my brain success will look like. Mm-hmm. And that's different. And I think that's the same for women because everybody loves money. And if you are successful, they'll, th- you know, the, you know, the saying, it's like everyone wants to give you money when you don't need it. Right. So once you don't need it, then it's like, take this, yeah. go ahead. Um, so it's more, I felt like it was pattern recognition more than it was racism. So I'd love to have each of you sort of provide us with your best takeaway or your best piece of advice on dealing with the media. I'm going to give two. All right. Okay. One is build relationships early and often. That's also one of the things that's going to help you when you're in a crisis communication, a crisis comms scenario, right? It's usually the person you don't know who's writing the investigative piece. You don't want to be left scrambling, figuring out who can I reach out to, who's willing to hear my side of the story. So those relationships do matter. My second piece of advice is actually fresh because I just watched a second episode of the most recent American Horror Story where Kim Kardashian plays PR 
guru extraordinaire, and she uh, sits um, Emma Roberts down, and Emma Roberts doesn't want to do the press tours, and she says, this is your campaign to the Oscars. I don't care what you want to do. You're not an actress right now. You're an athlete. And treat this as if you're like an athlete going for the Olympics. And I think a lot of founders, when thinking about press, it's just this side thing that they have to do. They don't give it the same level of practice, intention, and importance. And I think treat everything like you're an athlete. We should follow Kim Kardashian's <laughs> advice. You know? Okay. Uh, I'm a Kim fan. <laughs> Stacy. Um I love Billie Jean King's quote, pressure is privilege. And I think whenever I'm about to walk into a situation, I always try and remember I am living in my dream. This is part of it. This is, you know, you can't have the cake without the calories. You don't get the horse without the horse manure. It's all part of the package. And so even when you're in pressure situations, be grateful that someone wants you on their TV show, that someone's sitting across from you. Always be respectful of them, appreciate them. There's a human being doing a job on the other side. They're not out to get you, they're not trying to hurt you, but you know what, they need ratings, they need to sell papers or whatever. And so that helps to keep it in perspective. But remember that pressure that you're under is a privilege. It's an honor to be sitting in that seat, in that captain's chair that some investors or some friends and family believed in you that you could do it. And you're carrying the responsibility of that moment in all of those people that bet on you and act like it. I love that. I was just gonna call back to something we talked a little bit about earlier, which is I think, you know, when you really care about what you're doing, about the problem you're solving, about the message you're sharing, it goes a long way. And I also love, you know, almost anybody with a business is talking to other people about it a lot. Uh, friends, family, employees, customers, you know, look for where people's eyes light up or where people lean in, the things that actually get a human reaction, because it's almost like a free way to get feedback on where are those little points of interest or emotional resonance or humor or the gasps. And, you know, then I also, I have really loved having the opportunity, in addition to being part of other stories, to sometimes just write what is the thing. You know, you did it in your book. We were talking earlier about contributed articles or op-eds or opinion pieces or even could be a long-form post on social, but sometimes um, there's no substitute for just sitting down and thinking about what do you want to say in full and then getting it out there. Mm -hmm. And Scott? I think it goes back to one of my long-winded stories from <laughs> earlier. And, and, and that, it, you know, that is the, the story you want isn't necessarily the story that needs to be told, but that's okay. It's all part of a piece and it all has the opportunity to move you forward in some way. And as long as it's not the big mistake, the jumping into the uh, Wall Street Journal mass email first, it, it's helpful to participate, to get the experience we talked about before, to start the relationships that Taryn's talking about, and advancing just a little bit in some way the, the name of your brand and uh, the name of you and you as the leader uh, of, of that brand or that company. And if you do it right and you're doing a good job as a founder, uh, you'll eventually get the stories you want. Um, unless you're unseated and thrown out of the door, the way Stacey was. But yeah. in the end, he got it back. Yeah. It back. Right? Yeah. Bravo. It back. Well, I have a tip too. If you are confronted with somebody who has a narrative and you want to change the narrative, here's a tip, is give them something better to talk about. Wow. Mm -hmm. Give them a better narrative. Yeah. That's a great place to wrap up. Thank you so much. I've truly enjoyed this conversation. Thanks to Taryn. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you, Catherine. And of course, thanks, Scott. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. That's all for today's episode of Inc. Uncensored. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your podcast platform of choice. Also, if you liked this episode or have suggestions of what topics you'd like to hear about, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or reach out to us on Inc.'s social channels on LinkedIn, Instagram, and the app formerly known as Twitter. Inc. Uncensored is produced by Julia Shu, Blake Odom, and Avery Miles. Mix and sound design by Nicholas Torres. Our executive producer is Josh Christensen. 
Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.